you know me so far, you know I don't like to just pull a scripture out and hit that one and go to that one and go, I like expository, okay? Expository teaching, if the instructor or the teacher has the right viewpoint or concept of God, is accurate and safe, okay? Much safer than topical teaching. Uh, <clears throat> of course, if they have the wrong viewpoint, then it ain't going to matter much what you do anyway. But, <clears throat> so I don't like topical necessarily, even though that's why I study a lot of times, but expository is overall the best, you know? And, it, and honestly, that's a, an aspect of uh, preaching that we have lost a lot in the church. Almost everything nowadays is expository or uh, topical instead of expository. And so a lot of times when I teach, uh, if they ask me to stay over and teach on a Sunday, a lot of times I'll stay over and teach. And if I do, unless God gives me something specific for that group to, to bring, then a lot of times I will choose a passage, like a chapter or something, and just work through it and get the people used to that so that's what they do. All right? So I highly suggest that's what you do. And, and, and you already even finish up 1 John chapter 3 and go through that because there's just so much in here. Now, remember this though. Okay, let's kind of work backwards. We're going to work from third, yeah, First John chapter three, verse two. Beloved, now we're the sons of God. Now, not future. It does not yet appear we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And you go back to verse one. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. All right now. Go back to verse 27 of chapter 2. But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. Verse 20. But you have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now, go with me back to Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> Because you are sons, verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Then you're going back, and you notice we're just kind of working backwards. In verse 1, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. And you're going back and talk about Abraham's uh, and being uh, Abraham's seed. We talk about who that the promise was made to Christ through Abraham. Now, see, you have to understand. Let's, let's stop here as we head back. God called Abraham, talked to him, said, "Here's what I want to do." Abraham says, "Okay." God is trying to get into the world so that he can bring Christ in, so that he can finish the job, right? Fix everything, take everything. The covenant he made, starting with Abraham, then went with Christ. Then the law came in. In the law, the law was placed within the covenant, but it did not change the covenant. And what I mean by placed within the covenant, what I mean is this. God, knowing that people couldn't live the way he wanted them to, he had to show them that they couldn't live that way that would, should direct them to Christ when Christ would come. Now, the thing is, he, with the covenant, there had to be a blessing for keeping it and a curse for breaking it. Now, Jesus became the curse because we know that Jesus kept the law perfectly. Right? He completely fulfilled the law. He completely fulfilled everything. Never broke the law. Never sinned. And therefore, because... Now get this. Because he didn't sin, there was no need for a curse. Right? So, but because there is a curse applied to the covenant, then Jesus became that curse because when you, someone could ful perfectly fulfill the law, there was no need for a curse. So he became a curse for us, which once the law was perfectly fulfilled and was never broken, then there was no need for a curse, so the curse was wiped away. Right? So when Jesus came, when he, until he died, there was a possibility that he could mess up. Right? There was always a possibility that he could sin. But the minute he died, that ended the covenant in the sense that it sealed it. 
Right? So at the minute he died, when a man dies, then you can't add to the covenant or take away or anything else. So when that was sealed, he got, basically he went through it and completed it without breaking it. So the minute that happened, that curse was gone. So he became the curse literally for us to bear what we, to bear what we had done, not for his own sake because he was perfect and sinless. Right? So then he bore that so that we don't have to. Now, that means that that covenant that God made with Abraham and, and Jesus, and technically it was a covenant with God. Right? So I'm doing like this. Right? Actually, for you, it'd be like this, I guess. God, beginning the covenant, came down through Abraham and went to Jesus. Whenever Jesus fulfilled it, that sealed it. Right? In other words, it's done. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken away. It's complete. No need for a curse because he fulfilled it without ever breaking the law. Right? Now, and this goes back. Remember we've been talking about authority and I'm going to bring all that back in right now. What happened at that point? It said, if you read the scriptures, it said that God made Jesus Lord and Christ. Right? That means... And, and matter of fact, if you read through Psalms, in Psalms it says, you know, God said to, to the Lord, actually it's talking about Jesus, but he said, sit there on my right hand. He said, behold, today you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Isn't that right? If you go back, I could bring up the scriptures here. But essentially what he's saying is, whenever he rose from the dead, the Bible says when he ascended, he took captivity captive, and it said that he let, he was going to lead or bring many sons to glory. Right? Now, this covenant that Jesus had with the Father is complete and closed, meaning it can't be added to, can't be broken, can't be taken apart, anything. Right? Because he died. The minute he died, boom, it's sealed. Now, you do not have a covenant with God. Right? You don't. You are in Christ. Christ has a covenant with God. You get in Him. Right? He's in you. You're in Him. He's in the Father. He's in this covenant. He took away the curse. The curse is gone. So now, it's not your covenant. Because see, if you, if you have a covenant with God, then you can break it. If you made a covenant with God, you can break it. Right? Now, the reason you can't break the covenant Jesus made with God is because you didn't make it. That's why you can be in Him. And then if you sin in Him, you're not breaking the covenant. Now watch. He says that we have an advocate with the Father. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Right? And if we confess our sin... Now, understand, confessing sin does not mean, I'm sorry, God, I stole... I'm sorry, I cussed, right? Or got drunk, or whatever you want to say. That's not confessing your sin, okay? That's the way you confess to a policeman, okay? The word confess in the Greek is a, a Greek word which is homo legeo, okay? And it means homo same, and legeo, lege, is the word for sayings or words. So it means to say the same thing. Right? So confessing your sins is not saying, I did this, I did that, I did this, and I did that. Okay. To confess your sins to God. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Confession your sin does not mean saying you've sinned. Confessing your sin means to say the same thing about your sin that God has said about it. Alright? That's why it's a matter... See, even repenting. Repenting does not mean feeling bad. Just because you felt bad about what you did, that's not repentance. Repentance means to change your mind. It means to turn around, to be converted, literally, to turn around and go the opposite direction. Okay? If we were Greek speaking, those U-turn signs with the line through them means no U-turn would be no repentance. That's what it would mean. It would mean because that would mean to turn around and go the opposite direction. It'd be, you cannot turn around and go the opposite direction. That means you could not repent. I'm just trying to give you a visual. Okay? 
So you are to say the same thing about your sin that God said about it, which means you have to say all of the same thing. Number one, yes, I did this. Yes, it was wrong. And right now, yes, I'm confessing it to you. I'm agreeing with you that it is wrong, but I'm also agreeing with you that you are just and righteous to forgive me and cleanse me. And I thank you. I receive forgiveness and cleansing and I'm right and just before you and the devil can't bring it back up. That's what it means to confess your sin. And then when somebody brings that up, at that time you look at him and you say, get behind me, Satan. Because only the devil remembers my sin. And if you're bringing it up, I know who you're working for. Because you ain't working for God, because God doesn't even remember it. Right? Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> I got scripture, I'm not going to go into all of it. I would, if, if I give you the word conscience, okay, two words. Purge. And conscience, okay, or purge, and I gotta forget, I'm backwards here. Purge and conscience. Remember those two words for later if you want to, and you can look them up in a concordance, and it'll give you a scripture in Hebrews, okay? Read that whole passage, it's all there. The Old Covenant, the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was always thinking it's coming. The Old Covenant always says God is out there. We're not connected to Him. We know Him, but we're not connected to Him. But now the Old Covenant did not remit sins. Under the Old Covenant, sins were atoned. That means that the word atonement means to cover. Sins were atoned. They were covered with the blood of bulls and goats. Blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. It could just keep... God from doing anything about your sin until the next year when it had to happen all over again. So every year the sins were still there. But every year it was kind of like rolled back until the next year. Now the word atone means to cover. Jesus did not atone for your sins. He did not cover your sins. He remitted your sins. Okay, there's a difference. Now, under the old covenant, every person always had a guilty conscience. Because the Old Covenant could do nothing to purge your conscience of the sins you committed because they were still hanging over your head. They were only covered and held back. Je or not Jesus, but Paul writing in Hebrews, Jesus through Paul, writing in Hebrews, made it very clear that the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that the Old Covenant could not purge your conscience and the New Covenant would not only could, but if you're in the new covenant, your conscience is purged of your sins and you do not have a guilty conscience or a constant remembrance of your sin. Now, that knocks out about 90% of the people in the church. Okay? Now, the reason, I'm not saying you're not saved. Right? But I'm saying you've not been taught Therefore, the enemy works in areas of ignorance. So you have to be taught that this purges your conscience. And then when somebody walks in that, everybody thinks, well, look at them, man, they just don't have any conscience at all. Look, because I know what they've done, and look, they act like they're... No, they have a conscience, it's just been purged. Why? Because they're really walking in the new covenant. That's the beauty of the new covenant. The new covenant, see, that's... If I went back home, back to, you know, kind of where I was raised up around, especially before I was... Now, I claimed to be a Christian since I was nine, but I sure didn't walk like one, right? And in the early days, you know, in my early, you know, late teens, early 20s, that kind of stuff, I'm telling you, I could go back to that area where I was at, and I, and I have a better reputation for the crazy things I did than for the good things I'm doing now. And one time, my son-in-law, his dad, had actually had some serious back problems, and I came in off of a trip, and he said, would you go up and pray for my dad? Now, I didn't want to go. I was tired. I'd been gone for like two or three weeks. I just wanted to sit down and rest. And I didn't want to go. But I made a vow to God before I ever started the ministry that said, I will never turn down an opportunity to pray for someone or, or to preach, either one. And so I told him, I said, yeah, okay, I'll go. So I said, but it was his dad, and they hadn't seen each other in a while, and his dad was fixing to go through a whole bunch of back surgery and all kinds of stuff. And I knew if we went up there, it's going to be a family reunion thing. And I didn't want to be there that long. So I told him, I said, you take your car, I'll take my car, I'll pray for him. When I get done, I can leave and that way you can stay. Because I wasn't getting trapped 
up there waiting for him to leave. Okay? I learned. Take your own car. Right? Always take your own car. Okay? Then, so on the way we're driving up, I didn't want to go. I told God I didn't want to go. I said, I'm, I said God, I'm going for one reason. Because I made a vow to you that I would not turn it down. And that's why I'm going. Now, I know that doesn't sound very spiritual to you. But I'm trying to show you that I wouldn't do what you thought I have to do to be spiritual. And to get results. So I'm driving up there. And when I tell God that, he says, when you get there, ask for a cup of water. And I thought, God, I don't like water. I mean, I'd rather ask for a Coke. And he said, ask for a cup of water. And I thought, okay. So I get up there. And when I walk up to the door, he, this guy comes to the door. My son-in-law's ahead of me. And this, this guy didn't know who I was or who was coming to pray for him. He just knew somebody was. And so when I walked up to the door, he got to the door and opened the door and said, well, JT... Okay, that's not my initials, okay? The problem was he remembered me from a nightclub called The Electric Company back during the Saturday Night Fever days. <laughs> JT was a nickname some people gave me because of my dancing, stood for John Travolta because of the dancing. Okay. <laughs> so... So the minute he said that, first thing he says, I remember you from the electric company. And I'm thinking, I might as well go home because this guy ain't getting nothing today. Right? Because I'm thinking, he remembers me after the flesh, not after the spirit. Okay? And I'm thinking, well, I'm already here. I might as well go through with it. But honestly, I, I, at that point, I didn't have much faith working. Okay? So we go in and he's moving slow. And I mean, you could tell the pain on his face. He was hurting. So we're going in and we sit down at the table. I said, all right, well, I said, can I, can I get something to drink? Can I get a cup of water? And his wife kind of got up to go get it. I said, well, excuse me. I said, but can you get it? And, you know, it seemed kind of mean because he's sitting down hurting, pain and everything. And he didn't get it. You know, he didn't understand what was going on. And I didn't tell him. So he said, well, okay. And so he slowed to get up and walked slow. And you could tell every step just hurt. He goes in, comes back in with a glass of water, sits it down in front of me, and I'm sitting there. And I didn't drink it because God didn't tell me to drink it. He just said, ask for it, right? <laughs> I didn't really want the water. We, we were in Oklahoma. I just really don't care for Oklahoma water. <laughs> okay? I did, don't really care for water at all, really. I, I like Fiji water, right? I actually bought Fiji water in Fiji one time, and I, I called my daughter and I said, guess what? I'm drinking Fiji water in Fiji. So, see, I'm still amazed at how God takes me around places, all right? I don't, um, I don't, I don't, I don't take anything for granted, amen? Because I know where I came from. And so, I'm standing there, and, or I'm sitting at the table with him, and he brings the water, and he's kind of looking at the water and looking at me, and like, like, thought you wanted some water. And I'm like, I tell you what, I said, the Bible says that you can't even give a prophet a glass of water except you get a prophet's reward. I said, now, I'm not a prophet. Don't claim to be a prophet. And I said, but, I said, I asked you for what I wanted. Now, you ask me for what you want. See, that's a covenant relationship. And it was where I was at at the time. It's how, I, you know, how God was working with me. And so, he said, well, what, what do you mean? He didn't get it right away. And I'm like, okay, you gave me what I asked for. If you could ask me for anything, what would you ask me for? And he's kind of like, well, I mean, not even thinking about his back, okay? And I'm like, maybe healing or something like that? And he's like, oh, I mean, it's like he got it. And he said, and, and then it was so funny because it was like he wanted to do it right, you know? <laughs> so I'm saying, okay, remember this. It's not what you say that gets the job done. It's who says it. That's what I've been trying to tell you this whole three days. It's not a formula. It's not what you say. Well, how do I pray for this? How do I pray? It doesn't matter. It's who says it. Because when a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees, and hell hears and obeys. So it's not what you say. Now, don't say something stupid. Don't say something negative. And you know what I'm saying? You, you say directly what you want. Let your yea be yea and your nay nay and just say, speak and say what you want. Amen? So don't be silly. And then, so I, he said, 
and he was getting all prepared. He wanted to say it just right, you know, it, like he was making f some formal prayer request thing. He's like, uh, Curry, w would you go to God and get my healing for me? And I said, God said to give to any man that asks you. I said, so you asked me for healing, so I am bound, according to Scripture, to get it for you. He's sitting there, and, he's, and this is more for me than him. And so I said, all right. I said, stand up. And he's like, man, it's slow, and you could, I mean, hurting, right? And he, at that time, I found out later, at the time we were there, he was on some of the strongest painkiller that he had been taking it all along. But he was on some of the strongest painkiller, and he was still in some of the most intense pain I'd ever seen anybody in. There's been about four other cases maybe that would be worse that I've seen. One man, I could breathe on his foot, and he would scream. I mean, literally scream, just from the pressure of air on his foot. It was a horrible thing. Anyway, whole different story. But, so he stands up, and I walk around behind him. I put my hand on his back, and I said, In the name of Jesus, back, you do your job. You hold him up straight, and in the name of Jesus, I command all pain to go, and I command you to be healed now. Did about that strong. Took my hand off his back, and I said, All right, do what you couldn't do before. And so he stood there for a second, like he was thinking, and then he realized, he, you know, touched his toes. He was still scared, because in that kind of pain, imagine trying to touch your toes. But it was the funniest thing, because as he went down, he was expecting to see the pain, you know, to feel the pain. And as he went down, he was looking at me, and as he went down, he's like, and started smiling, you know. And he didn't, he, I can't remember if he went all the way down, touched toes, not, but when he came back up, he's like, Whoa, well, thank you, Kurt, and grab my hand straight. I'm like, hey, he did it, right? It's just pouring through, but give the glory to God. And he was all excited, and then my son-in-law started talking to him, and I'm like, all right, you're done, I'm done, I'm out of here, right? I got back in my car, cried all the way home. Why? Because I didn't even want to be there. You know what I mean? I went because I committed to it. But I was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a guy came in to service. Um, I think he came in uh, yes, second, second day or something like that. They weren't regular DHDs. It was just night services. <clears throat> he came in the second night. Had back, back thing. Line of people. Had a lady in a wheelchair sitting right here that had a, a fourth stage multiple sclerosis. Yes. It, which means it's already reached her brain. And from that point on, it's done as, as far as doctors are concerned. She sat there, and I, got, I was down here preaching and walking back and forth. This was up in Harrisonburg, not here, but up there walking back and forth. And every time I walked past her, I guess she wasn't used to church, because every time I walked past her, she would start talking to me. Well, I was preaching, and she didn't understand that preaching is supposed to be monologue, not dialogue. <laughs> All right? So I'm going by, and she starts talking. And I'd walk by, and she'd go, did you feel that? And I'm like, thank you, okay, and I'd move it. So pretty soon, I'm just staying on the edges, you know. I didn't want to move back to the middle because she'd start talking to me again. But I'd walk past her, she goes, did you feel it that time? And I'm not feeling nothing. I mean nothing, right? But I'm just preaching the Word of God. I'm just preaching, preaching. And finally, I said, all right, it's time to have the healing service. So everybody line up right here, and we're just going to go right down the aisle here. And so she was already there, so she was the first one in line, right? Now, most people don't like to start with the hard cases, Right? Let's start with some headaches and stuff like that, and then we'll work up to the wheelchair. Okay? That's the way people think. So she's there, and, and they kind of lined everybody up, and then they came across this way, but she was still the first one I went to. And so when I walked over, I was walking to her, and she goes, So what do I do now? Just get up? And, and then, now this was years back, okay? And I'm still, my mind hadn't been, I'm not, I wasn't near as free then as I am now, okay? And, and I'm still a little religious in these areas at that time. And she goes, what do I do now? Just get up. And I'm like, well, uh, let's make it legal. i, I got to lay hands on you. I mean, you know, that's, the way, that's the way I'm thinking. So I laid hands on her, commanded her to be healed. And I said, all right. She goes, now do I get up? And I said, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm trying to think anything else we need to do. And, you know, and she, yeah, I get it. So she just gets up. And so I walk with her a little bit, and she's, you know, like this. I mean, her legs are real wobbly, and she's just moving around. And, but the people are like, because everybody there knows everybody there. And this was a church of the brethren, right? So it's not known for their enthusiastic, charismatic worship, right? So this was all new to them. They never seen anything like this. I mean, it wasn't like they were going, ah, it was more like, 
I mean, they were just, you know, shocked. And so I'm walking with her a little bit, and, but there's a lot of people, and so I couldn't stay with her, you know, a long time. So I brought her back to a wheelchair. Now, I didn't get her in the wheelchair. I, I told her, I said, don't get back in the wheelchair. Most people get out of a wheelchair. If they get back in it, they never get back out. So I told her to get out. So I pulled the wheelchair out, put her hands on the handle, and I said, here, walk around with this. I said, keep walking, right? Get it going. And so she's walking, and she's like this, you know, pushing that wheelchair. She starts going around, and it, it looked like the Indy 500. I mean, she was very slow. She was like the pace car, you know what I'm saying? Going real slow around the deal. But all the people around the edge were like, go, go, go. I mean, they're cheering her on. I mean, it was exciting to watch them go. And she, but by the time she got back around, she's walking normal. Completely walking over. And when she walked out that night, she pushed that chair together, turned it around, and walked out dragging that chair with her. Completely healed. I think she'd been there... It was, it was several years. I don't know how many years for sure. Well, there was another guy there that came up and said, I have back problems. I said, okay. Put my hand in his back, commanded healing. Had, they had this handheld mic, which I don't like. I talk too much with my hands to use a handheld mic. When I use a handheld, it's like, so we, you, yeah, you know, because I'm on. So you don't hear all everything. So that's why I use this one. All right? It's just, so I don't like the handheld. But I, they, that's what I had that night. So I said, put the hand, okay, how's that? And the guy's like, well, yeah, that's better. And he's, he's moving like this. And I'm thinking, no, you got to move. You got to do something, you know? And he's like, like, I mean, that's it, you know? And I'm thinking, no, you got to move more than that or it's, we're not going to get it, you know? I said, all right, you stay here for a minute, let it work, and I'll be back in a minute. Went down, prayed for people, come back, and I said, how's it now? He goes, it's better. And I said, better than it was, or better than it was when you got here, or better than it was after I prayed for you? He said, well, better than it was after you prayed for me. I said, all right, let's do it again. Bam, hit it again. We did about three or four times. We let, and he's still like this, and I'm thinking, man, you can't move, touch your toes, do something. So he, that night, he leaves. Next day, I'm getting ready for the service. He comes in and says, Brother Curry, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. So he pulls me back in the pastor's office. He says, my back's healed. And I'm like, glory to God. That's good. Yeah. No, you don't get it. My back's healed. My back's healed. God, you, my back is healed. You don't understand. I'm like, no, okay. back's healed. Glory to God. Okay. He goes, I can touch my toes. And I'm like, okay. You know, I didn't really, I don't think, think I told him to at that point, but he was excited about it. Wait, what? And I, I'm kind of like, healing ministry, backs get healed all the time. Okay, glory to God, it's good. But I didn't, you know, start doing somersaults and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because that happens normally. It's a normal thing. See, when somebody tells you they're healed and you're surprised when you're in the healing ministry, that's a problem. Okay? Okay? That shouldn't be a surprise, right? And so, he goes, he, finally he gets fed up. And he's like, no, you don't get it. Just wait here. And he goes out to his car. He comes back in. He's got this big envelope thing. He pulls out these x-rays. He goes, look at this. I'm like, yeah, what is that? He goes, that's my back, and that's a steel rod in my back. That's a steel rod? I said, you, steel? He goes, yeah, when I drive, I had to drive straight. He said, I could not bend. You get it? And I'm like, well, you just said you could touch your toes. He said, yeah, I can touch my toes. I said, touch your toes. I wanted to see it, right? So he touches his toes. I said, do it again. Like, you know, like the first time doesn't count. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so he touches again. I'm like, wait a minute. I said, this is a miracle. He goes, that's what I've been trying to tell you. You know? And so he's getting all excited. And I said, well, you had a steel rod. He goes, yeah, doctors put a steel rod in my back. When I drove, I had to drive straight. I had to have my car fixed so I could drive straight. He goes, I went home last night, went to bed, woke up this morning, when I got out of bed, raised up. He said, I can bend. He said, I can touch my toes. I said, so what you're saying is that either way it's a miracle, but either God took the steel rod out of your back or he turned it into rubber so it, so it bends, right? And he said, that's what I'm telling you. And he said, I'm going back to the doctor on Monday. I said, well, you call me and let me know what the deal is. Let me know. Well, when he called, he went. I was already gone by then. But whenever he called us, the steel rod disappeared out of his back. Now, now, now listen, whenever I prayed for him, I did not ask him what his problem was. He just said back problems. And to be honest with you, if he'd have said, well, I got a steel rod in my back, it'd still be there today. Because I, I, I didn't think that I could have faith for a steel rod to disappear. You understand? Sometimes you know too much. You don't need to know that. It's God that does it. Let Him do it. Amen? Just think 
I don't want to say think big, but you know, believe big. All right? And that's why a lot of times when I pray for people, you tell me something, I'll pray, and then I'll say, just be healed from head to toe. Just total healing. Because I'm shooting for total healing, not an individual thing. All right? And, and if I don't ask you, you know, if, if I say, well, what's the problem? Then give me the name, give me the symptom. Okay, but don't go into detail. Don't go into too much. I don't need to know that much. I'll get into sympathy with you, and you'll talk me out of faith. Right? And then you'll leave sick. So just don't do it. Just tell me what I ask you, and then stop. All right? I don't need your medical history. I'm not a doctor. I don't need to know, well, it started when I was two, and then it went into, unless I ask you, well, how long has it been? And see, and just answer the question. All right? Real simple. Now, <clears throat> a couple of years later, well, actually, two weeks after I left there, I, I might have told you about this part, where the, uh, they were having a worship service, the lady dropped dead. That was that church. I didn't tell you about that. Oh, well, two weeks later, the, they, they were having a worship service. In the middle of the worship service, the lady dropped dead. And so they were... They looked at her for a few minutes, called EMTs, and said, yeah. And yeah, I did tell you all this, didn't I? Yeah. I thought I did. Yeah, I thought I told you here. <laughs> and, and, but they just got around her and said, well, let's do what Brother Curry taught us. We can't hurt her. She's already dead. <laughs> right? And so they just started, got around her and started commanding her to come back until she sat up. So see, and, and they were Church of the Brethren, right? They weren't full-fledged, tongue-talking, charismatic, Pentecostal. It wasn't that. They just believed the Word of God. And so, then a couple of years later, or, yeah, I guess it would have been a couple, well, no, actually, it was, I think it was the same year, as a matter of fact, I went to uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, and a lady got in the meetings, and a lot of neat things happened there, but there was one lady that came in, and she had some situations going on in the back, we prayed for her, she went home, went to bed, woke up the next morning, felt something poking her in the back, she rolled over, matter of fact, wait a minute, yes. Ha! I got pictures. <laughs> and my daughter and grandkids, see this is, because I'm on the road all the time. That's my grandson. My, my, my son and my grandson. So <laughs> Other grandson. Blank picture. No, wait a minute. Okay, there it is. That <laughs> but, and that was the first DHT I ever taught in houses. It was in houses up in over in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, we just... I went to three different houses over the period of about a week and taught 200 people, uh, prayed for 200 people. Forty of them had terminal cancer. All 40 terminal cancer patients healed. The 200 people that we know of were healed. We went from house to house. I'd preach in the morning, walk down the street, eat a snack, get to the next house, preach from, from lunch on, and just did that each night. And half of them were uh, Rick Joyner's healing team. They had come up and different people. So anyway, that's a picture of that. This, when this woman woke up, this, this, was, this is three pounds of surgical steel. It's, you know, nuts and bolts and bars and all that kind of stuff that a doctor put in her back. And when she woke up, it was laying in her bed. You know I mean? And so it, um, she gathered it all up, brought it to the church service that night, and this is, it's on a music stand. We put on a music stand and we took a picture of it. And so, same, same meetings, there was, um, see, I ain't just talking. See, we, we got proof, all right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, in the same meetings, there was a lady that came in that was pregnant. I told you about this in two part of it. She was pregnant with twins, been dead for two weeks. Same, there was the same meetings. And she came up, prayed for her on the way home, felt the movement, went to the hospital, gave birth to two live boys. After two weeks, doctors verified they were dead for two weeks. All right? Then, <clears throat> same meetings. There was a, the night we had the healing service, there was a little woman, little bitty woman, real sweet, elderly, a uh, little bun in her hair, the whole bit, just a real sweet little lady. She came up, she was deaf, completely deaf. There was an elder, a deacon, holding, you know, kind of standing with her, holding her. And I got back and I was feeling pretty good, right? See, a lot, the, the, you can't get hung up on methods. Methods are based upon the emotions of the person ministering, right? And if, if I'm tired and been going three weeks and, you know, all that kind of stuff, I'm tired, you know, the healing service is going to be very simple. Be healed, do it now in Jesus' name, bam, 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 all right? Very simple. Why? Because I'm tired. I'm not going to yell and scream. Why? I'm tired. If my voice is going out, I'm not going to yell and scream. Now, if it's the first night, 
I might yell and scream. I might be, you know, if it's the first night on the road or something, man, I'm pumped, ready to go. Okay, but I can also get excited. Well, this night, I was just feeling extra, uh, how can I say it? Um, hmm. Well, in Texas, we call it cocky. Okay, you understand what I mean? Just, just kind of like, yeah, you know, you just do something, you know. <clears throat> make some noise somehow, right? Do something, make, you know, even if we make people mad, at least that'll be something, right? And so I'm feeling pretty good. And I, I had this, back then I was wearing suits. I'm, suit, and I'm telling you, the devil came up with that. You ever notice people in suits and ties, you look like you're in a coffin. Yeah. Isn't it right? And, and you don't want to move. You're kind of like, what? Yeah, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you're already dead, you know? And, and do you know, they did research. They, <laughs> they did research and they proved now that if you wear a tie... That it'll, I'm not telling you it will happen to you, but I'm saying doctors say that people who wear ties a lot develop glaucoma because it cuts off the blood flow and puts too much pressure in the eyes. All right? See, devil's been trying to kill preachers for years. Nobody even knew, right? So I quit wearing ties and suits, and for the most part, I got a suit, but don't usually wear them a lot. But I, w I will, if I go to a particularly religious church, I'll wear a suit just to lull them into a false sense of security. <laughs> you know? And then, okay. And then, but then if, if, you know, if I have my, as we say in Texas, druthers, you know what I mean? If, we have, if I have my druthers, I just, this is the way I dress, this is the way I dress normally. Blue jeans, boots, shirt, vest, you know? I, I actually have two vests. I was debating on wearing them because I don't know y'all well enough. But I was debating on whether to wear them or not, and I didn't want to offend anybody, but I got vests that were actually uh, Civil War style. You know, they got the tall collars, and they're, they're blue, and they're the, almost like the wool kind of thing. They're not really hot. You would think they would be, but they're straight for I got a blue one and a gray one, just depending on which, you know, where y'all were going. So, <clears throat> wasn't sure. I got, them, I got them in the motel, and I was going to wear them. I like them. I like the way they feel. I like the way they fit, and I was going to wear them. But then I thought, okay, which one should I wear first, the gray or the blue? And... Whichever one I wear first, I'm going to make the other people mad. And I'm not sure, you know, just, I just wasn't sure, you know, didn't know you that well. <clears throat> but next time I come up, I'll wear one of them. All right? So, but, but I like them. And, it, you know, that's just the way I like to dress. I, I tell everybody, I was born about at least 100 years too late. I really, I could have been born about 100 years ago. It been fine with me. So, <clears throat> but we're there, and I had the suit on. And so I'm feeling pretty, you know, cocky, as we said. And so finally, I, just, I said, watch, I'm going to show you. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter. It's my intention, and it's where I release my faith that counts. So don't get hung up on a method. The message is sacred. The methods are not. Okay? And so I said, watch. I pulled my jacket off, and it's you know, almost ready to pull a Billy, a Billy hen, a Benny hen. Right? You know, where you wave your jacket to people and all that kind of stuff. Well, I was, about, I was at that point. So I pulled this jacket off, lay her on the side, and I said, watch this. I stepped back about 15 feet, and that man standing there holding that little woman, and you know, just kind of standing there. And i like, watch this. In the name of Jesus, you deaf and dumb spirit, because she's deaf both ears. Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you in Jesus' name, you, you leave her now. And just did like that. Bam, both of them went down, 15 feet away. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm feeling good, you know? <laughs> so I'm ready. So they fall down, they start getting back up, and, you know, the deacon's getting up, and the one, he's helping the woman up, and she comes over, and it's like, she can hear perfectly. I'm like, yeah, and everybody's, everybody's happy. Then the deacon walk, walks over to me and says, Brother Curry, you know, I didn't say anything, but I've been deaf in my left ear for so like 15 years. I mean, it's a long time. And he said, I can hear. He got healed. Now, I was aiming for the woman. <laughs> right? And I looked at him and I said, glory to God. I said, you know what that means? I said, now we know why Jesus called him a deaf and dumb spirit. <laughs> right? Because I was, I was talking to the one in her, and the one in you is dumb and didn't know it, and he left too. And so, right? Now, now I, don't, I don't know if that's exactly accurate theologically, right? <laughs> but... <laughs> But I figure, I figure if you rebel against God, you've got to be kind of dumb anyway, right? So, figure that. Now, when, when we were in, um, what was that time? Where were, where were we? I think we were over here in Chesapeake. No? Yeah, it was Chesapeake. I think it was Chesapeake. We had a, um, uh, well, we had the healing service, and there was a little girl there, that, a little bitty girl that was deaf, 
Do you remember that one uh, over here in Chesapeake? The healing service? Remember the little girl that was deaf? Couldn't hear. Went on. She got prayed for. Her, mom, her grandma, I think it was her grandma. Was it grandma that was there with her? Was talking about how she was deaf. And she was like, no, grandma, I can hear. God just opened her ears. Other, and she started praying for other people too while I was there. I mean, it, see, we make a big deal out of it. And, and it's neat how it works. But that... I could go on and on with different testimonies. Oh, I, there is one I've got to tell you. I told you last night. No, I told... Well, when we went to eat last night, I told you guys that I would tell you about it. About Angelo? I hadn't told you about Angelo, right? Okay. Well, I'll tell you real quick. How are we doing on time? We okay? We got plenty of time? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, we got plenty of time. Okay, we ain't going to take that long. I'll get you out here in about five minutes or so. This, um, we went to Italy. I guess it was 05, something like that, 06. <clears throat> and... Um, we go over, they invite us over, I went to uh, Reggio de Calabria, which in Acts, was it, 26, it's, it's Regium, you know, where Paul preached. It's the same place, same city. So we go there and we went into Malta and I preached in Malta. I saw where Paul shipwrecked, I saw the prisons where he was kept and, you know, it, it's funny because you go there and they're like, Paul was shipwrecked here, Paul was shipwrecked here. Paul was shipwrecked here. He stayed here. He was in this. It's like, man, you'd think Paul shipwrecked about 15 times right around Malta. You know? Of course, it's all on the tours you have to pay for to go see it. You know? And here's, this is the prison he stayed in, and that's the prison he stayed in. It's like, okay, Paul wasn't here that long. You know? So you kind of have to figure out what, what's true. So we go to Malta. We go to um, <clears throat> into, we went back into Italy, up through Sicily. Uh, went into Italy. Preached in Reggio de Calabria. Then they had us go up this mountain. And we went up this mountain in a place called Palmy. And it's way up on the mountain. And there was a brand new Pentecostal church which had never been preached in. And they asked me to come up and kind of christen it. And so we went up to, to preach there. And they would open up the doors. And you could see the Mediterranean. I mean, it was just a beautiful place. My wife, my daughter, and my mother-in-law went with me on the trip. And so we're all going over there. And you know, my mother-in-law wants to retire there now. She's ready to go there. And so... We go, we open up the doors, the wind's blowing through, it's beautiful, it's just, you know, almost like out of a fairy tale. And so, we, when we get there, they put us in this uh, apartment thing. The, the people that brought us over owned a seven-story apartment complex, and they had an olive oil press business in the bottom, okay? And so, they owned this whole apartment complex, and so they put us in the top floor that had this patio thing around, you could walk out and look out over the... Mediterranean, you could look on the mountains of Sicily and see the lights at night and Malta. And it was just, you know, unreal. Very beautiful. And so we're up there. Now, the elevator to get up to the hotel is probably smaller than this. I mean, it's tiny, okay? Most elevators, other places like that are. So, now, here's the problem. I get on there. Okay, I'm the only male traveling with three women. Okay? So first off, you know, note to self, always carry another young man with you. Because three women have a lot of luggage. And they don't pull it themselves. Okay? <laughs> so I'm lugging all this. And I'm, you know, I'm the speaker. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm supposed to be somebody. <laughs> you know? And I'm just pulling all this stuff. And, you know, tired. And... <clears throat> I put it on the elevator, and the thing is so small, when I put two bags on there, I can't get in. And so I have to sit on top of the luggage and push the button and then turn my feet sideways so the door will shut, right? So it goes up, and it's slow going up. So when I finally get up there, take all the luggage. I have to do this like six times, right? Because everybody's got two pieces of luggage. Thank God the airports don't let you carry three or four because we would have had more. So we're going up. I get it all up. Finally, they said, okay, we're going to go upstairs, and they get up, you know, they get on the elevator, and they start. Now, they can get in there, because they're all, you know, it's mother, daughter, and daughter, right? So, they're all closed in together. So, they go up. So, I'm thinking, it's only seven flights. I'm going to beat them up there. So, I take a run up these stairs. And this was only three years ago. I'm 50 now. So, I go run up these stairs. I, I beat them. Up seven, that's what, well, I wasn't fast. That's how slow the elevator was. I told you that, right? <laughs> But I, I beat him up there, and I get up there, and there's a walkway out on the patio, and I mean, I can't breathe. I mean, I'm like, well, my wife's right. I'm not 25 anymore. You know, I'm like, and, I, and everything starts to black out, and I'm thinking, so I go out on the patio trying to get more air, 
And I'm thinking, I'm going to pass that out here and they're not going to find me for three days. You know, and I'm thinking all this stuff and I'm like, Lord, I hate to come to Italy to die. This ain't the time. You know, give me some hair here. So we go through all this stuff. We start the meetings. The next day we go up to the mountain. We're preaching. On the way down, Sebi, the guy that brought us there, said, Brother Curry, would you go pray for Angelo? And I said, well, yeah, what's the deal? We'll go, but what's, what's the deal? His uncle shot him. Now, he didn't say accidentally, on purpose, or anything. He just said his uncle shot him. He said, would you go pray for him? I said, yeah. He said, he is brain dead. He's been brain dead for two months. No activity. And now an infection has set in. And if he doesn't get healed, then they're going to pull the plug. And if they pull the plug, they're going to file charges on his uncle for murder. And I said, yeah, we'll go, pray. We'll go, go do it. So we go over there. We go up to this place. And we go in. And they're like, okay, now they, they'll only let one in at a time. So if you're going to go in and pray... They'll let you in. And they had windows. It was the in, intensive care unit. And over there, they'll have six or seven people in it. And they, there was these windows around the top that's like this wide. And they lifted me up so I could look. And they said, he's right there. That's him right there. And I said, okay. So I'll go over. And I put, you know, they made me put on all the stuff. So when I go in, I'm walking in like a doctor. You know, I got the mask. I got all this stuff. So I walk in. And I walk over to him. And I'm standing there. And, you know, I'm thinking about praying. But I, I don't like that. You know, I like to be able to put hands on, speak to him, and it's like, okay, so that ain't going to work. You know, not for me. I mean, I'm sure God can understand, but that's not what I like. So I'm standing there, and I'm looking at this. I'm trying to figure out what So I'm like, I pull the gloves off, pull the mask off, all this kind of stuff. And so I put one hand on his leg, one hand on his arm, which is, I always say that because that's what happened, but that's not important, right? Don't make a doctrine out of this, okay? Put my hands on him, like, Angelo, my name's Curry Blake. I'm here to wake you up. So in the name of Jesus, you wake up, and when you awake, your mind will operate correctly, your brain will function correctly, you will remember everything, and you'll be healed in Jesus' name. So wake up. That was it. Now, like we're, we're talking a minute. Start to try to walk off. Well, around the top of the ceiling, you know, the, they had the windows, but then they had windows above that that had no glass. It was just open. This is intensive care. There were birds flying through. They put all this garbage on me. <laughs> right? And birds are flying through the window. And I'm thinking, there's something not right about this, okay? So, we go down, start, we start to leave. On the way down, we pass this place. It's called a gelato shop, okay? Gelato is Italian ice cream. All right? Now, there is nothing on earth like it. There is nothing. Amen? I'm ten. When I think Italy, I think Angelo and gelato. Okay? And I'm not big on sweets. Now, I get most of my sugar out of a Coke, right? But I'm telling you, if there's gelato, when I was in South Africa, they had some, and I said, I, we're going right there. That's pull over. We're going right there. Because it is the best I've ever tasted. So, we had some gelato. Drove on down. Went back to the apartment. Later that night, said that there was this intercom system. Said we pushed the button. Eh, and I, yeah. What can I do for you? Brother Cuddy. Yeah, what is it? Say, what, what, can, what can I do for you? Can I come up and speak with you? I said, yeah, come on up. So he comes up, knocks on the door, opens the door, and he said, he's standing there kind of weird acting, you know? And I'm like, yeah, w what is it? What's going on? Um, Brother Cuddy, um, Angelo. I said, yeah, what about him? Um, Angelo, he, uh, he, he, he is a dead. And I'm like, I look at him and I'm like, hmm. That surprises me. So I just stand there and look at him. And he's waiting for me to give an explanation or an excuse or a reason or say something. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. He's waiting for me to talk. I'm not going to talk. Why? Because I'm not going to pull my faith back. I'm not going to agree. I'm not going to say anything. I'm like, well, it must be God's will. I'm, you know, I ain't going to do that. I'm still, I laid hands. See, when, I, when you, faith chooses the, the end from the beginning. And faith doesn't stop until the end is seen. If it stops before the end that you chose is seen, then you have weak faith or no faith, and it doesn't matter, right? Because it's not going to work. So, we stand here and look at each other. He's waiting for me to talk. I'm waiting for him to talk. I'm not going to say anything. He, you know, he's trying to get me to say something. And so finally he goes, oh, okay, well, um, it will see you in the morning. I'm like, okay. So he shuts the door. I tell my wife, I said, I'm fixing to go for a walk. Okay? That's how I like to pray. So I get on the elevator. It's a slow elevator. 
And so I start talking to God. I don't always do it this way, but I did it this way this time. Okay? I said, when I got on that elevator, the door shut, ching, and as soon as it did, I'm like, Father? Uh, the first thing I said was God, right? And which is not normally the way I talk to God, right? Usually it's Father, okay? I'm like, God, this ain't going to work. I said, I didn't come around the world to tell these people and give them this gospel and give them false hopes and pray for people and them die. I didn't come over to waste my time. I didn't come over to do all this. So Andrew lives. I don't care if you got to resurrect him. I don't care what, what you revive him, resurrect him. Well, I don't care. Whatever it is, Angelo lives, or I quit preaching and go back home. And so by that time, we got to the bottom, and it's ding, back open, and so now everything's fine. I had my little temper tantrum, you know, and, and then I went on. So I started walking around. I walked around for, actually, for probably a couple of hours, but I only prayed in tongues for probably 45 minutes or an hour, and walked around, just kind of prayed, and started worshiping, and it was done. So I go back in. Next morning, we go up the mountain. We're driving up, get there. I'm getting all wired up with all the microphone and everything. Sebi and Angelo's uncle come running up. Brother Cuddy, Brother Cuddy, have you heard about Angelo? I said, I heard he's dead. No, no, Angelo lives. Angelo lives. Last night he woke. He, re- he knew everyone. He spoke to everyone. He is fine. The infection, it's gone. And I'm like, glory to God. All right. And I, I got, well, okay, we got to go. I got to go preach. So we're walking up. And as I'm walking off, he goes, and Brother Cuddy, I just, I just ask you one thing. I'm like, Okay, what is it? He goes, last night when I told you Angelo is dead, uh, you said, hmm, that surprises me. Why do you say this? I said, because I'm not used to losing. And he goes, oh. I mean, like it was some deep theological thing, you know? (laughs) So, before I got to the front and got up on the platform, word spread. I mean, you could see, it was like a wave. It was like, because everybody heard. It wouldn't have mattered what I preached. I mean, they were ready for revival. You know what I'm saying? They were ready. Because everybody there knew Angelo. So we got up. We got to, I got to preaching. I got to talk. And then that night we had a healing service. And they opened the side doors. They couldn't put everybody in there. People were packed on the patios around looking in the door. And every, I mean, everything in here was packed. It was packed all around. People in wheelchairs. I mean, it got to where they were so packed I couldn't even get down off the platform to get to them. And so we started trying to touch and bless them and say, okay, be healed in Jesus' name. Now, go off that way. You know, kind of get on out of here so we can get to the others. And we went through, and the funny thing, this lady came up in a wheelchair, somebody pushed her up there, laid hands on her, command, and said, all right, be healed in Jesus' I mean, it wasn't even a hard thing. It was just be healed in Jesus' name. Now, all right, God bless you, and then do what you couldn't do before. And so I step off over here, and this woman, she's like, okay. So she just gets out of the wheelchair and walks off, and the guy's like, and he gets all excited and starts waving the wheelchair thing around, you know, and this woman's just walking off. And then the crowd again, you know, and people started getting healed that weren't even getting prayed for. I mean, just, it was like a, just a chain reaction and things. Like that. Anyway, so when I, when I think of Italy, I think of Angelo and Gelato. Amen? So, but, and, and again, I, man, I got testimony. We could be here for two weeks, easy, doing nothing but testimonies. But the thing is, I mean, you can tell, all right, I am not... I'm not theatrical. I'm not dynamic. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I don't have a, a, a you know, handkerchief and a microphone and running back and forth across a platform and waving the handkerchief and wiping my, you know, the sweat off my brow. And, you know, I, and I used to tell people, you know, I'm, this is, you know, I, I have to tell them, you know, you get in here, I'm, I, I don't have that Jimmy Swaggart thing down, you know, where you just, yeah, and then pose and wait for them to, I don't have, I don't know that, all right? So, you know. <laughs> But the amazing thing is, God honors His Word. Right? God's not honoring theatrics. That's just the personality of the person. See, God doesn't mind you having a personality. He doesn't mind if you really don't have a personality. It doesn't matter. It's just as long as you preach His Word. You preach His Word, you get the results of the Word. Amen? And anybody can do this. Any one of you can do this. You say, I don't believe that. You know what? It doesn't even matter. If you just preach it whether you believe it or not, they will believe it and they'll get it. See? Now, if you believe it, that helps. Because at some point, you're going to have to pray for somebody individually that doesn't have faith. And then they're going to have to get it from your faith. So it's better if you believe it. But you just got to get started. You know? And, and we're going to show you how to do that. We're going to take you to it. Walk you to it. Now, we were in Galatians. We're going to take you on back. Let me give it to you a couple more. 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
Second Corinthians chapter five. We got to work through this pretty quick. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse. Let's go to verse. Let's go to verse fifteen. No, sorry about that. Go to verse 14. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, from now on, Know we no man after the flesh. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now from now on know we him no more. So he's saying we don't even look at Christ after the flesh. Because what we saw of him walking the earth, even though he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, that's true. But there is a difference in how he deals with people and what is applied. right? And his position. Now, it says, Therefore... Since we know Christ after flesh no more. Therefore, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. One translation says a new species of being that never existed before. Now think about that. If you are a new species that never existed before, in other words, you're part of this new species, and this new species did not exist before, then that means you can't look at anyone past to pattern yourself after. Because you're a new species. Right? You can't look at the Old Testament saints and say, we should be like them. The Bible doesn't say you should be like them. It doesn't say follow them. It says follow their faith. Follow the faith of them who through faith and patience and consistency inherit the promises. Amen? Now, he says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, look, see... Check. All things are become new. And all things, everything that's become new, verse 18, are of God. Do you hear that? Old things are passed away. The old you has died. All things are become new. Now that's not talking about your body. And it's not even talking about your mind. Because your mind has to be renewed. That's talking about in your spirit. Your spirit, the old you in your spirit passed away. The new you is all new. Right? And all these new things that are in you are of God. You hear that? There is nothing in your spirit that's not of God. You get it? You got, you got to get an understanding of this. That's why I said you are perfect and complete in Him. He made you what He wanted you to be. Now you just grow up into it. Paul said, I travail in birth until, again, until Christ be formed in you. Well, isn't that what he wrote in Ephesians? That we're going to be conformed to the image. Well, actually in Ephesians what it says is that we're going to come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. See, I've showed you all these scriptures that all go back. You cannot believe what is generally taught in the church and believe the scriptures. Because you're not just a worm in the dust. You're not just somebody that's barely getting by. You're not somebody just waiting for Jesus to show up and get you out of here. Now are we the sons of God. Right? Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph through Christ Jesus. So you've got to realize, we are destined, pre, Bible, you want to talk about predestination, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That means God's, God's view of you is that you will end up looking just like Jesus. That's Ephesians 4.15. Right? You know, if you were to join the Marine Corps, and you tell someone, well, I joined the Marine Corps, well, really, well, what... What are you going to do? Well, I, don't know, I guess I'll go down and sleep till about 10 every morning. You know, and then I'll get that pretty uniform and I'll just march around a little bit. Yeah. Okay, your idea of being conformed to a Marine isn't the same idea of the Marine Corps' idea of being conformed to a Marine. Isn't that right? And when you get down there at boot camp, there's going to be a, a drill instructor there waiting on you. And to be honest with you, his idea of you being conformed to a Marine is the one that counts. Right? And, and if you don't agree with him and work with him, you'll get kicked out. 
Any right? Because his idea, his job is to conform you to the image of a marine. The fivefold ministry's job is to conform you to the image of Christ. Right? Not just fire insurance. Not just you sitting in church and, you know, paying your tithes and being a good Christian. Your job is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Right? All right. He says, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now watch. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, I have a healing ministry. Oh, I have a deliverance ministry. No, you don't. The only ministry mentioned is a ministry of reconciliation. And if I'm going to reconcile men's bodies back to God, they're going to get healed. If I'm going to reconcile men's spirits back to God, they're going to get saved. If I'm going to reconcile men's souls back to God, they're going to get delivered. Right? You give them life. It's not healing. It's not salvation. It's not deliverance. It's life. The only thing the Bible says you have is if you have Jesus Christ, you have life. That's it. So, if someone needs healing, give them life. Life drives out death, they get healed. If they need salvation, give them life. You give them Jesus, right? They get Jesus, they get life, they get saved. If their minds are messed up, their souls, they need deliverance, they have demons or this kind of stuff, what do you do? You give them life. And when you give them life, life drives out darkness. And they'll be free. So it's just life. Quit worrying about, well, what about this gift? Well, what about that gift? Well, how's it? That's up to God. He said he does it separately as he will. You be busy laying hands on the sick. You be busy casting out devils. If you need a gift, he'll be there to get it to you. Don't concern yourself with God's part. Concern yourself with your part. Amen? Now, he says, uh, let's see. Yeah. He has given us a ministry of reconciliation. To know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Amen? We can go on. Verse, or chapter 6, verse 1. We then as workers together with him... You hear that? We're workers together. We are co-laborers. Co-laborers. Now, going back to, quickly, to 1 Corinthians, or I'm not, no, I'm sorry, not 1 Corinthians. Go to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4. Luke 4. You know this story? This is where Jesus went to his hometown, preached. Verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And it was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit, and he started, now this is out of Isaiah 61, but this is what he started quoting as being fulfilled that day. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, we can go on and on in this, but at this point we're going to go back to verse 18 at the beginning. I want to show you how you read the Bible religiously. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me. Now, backwards church. The church usually says, I'm anointed because the Spirit's upon me. Right? Isn't that what you hear? I'm anointed because the Spirit's upon me. Is that what that verse says? It says just the opposite, doesn't it? It says the Spirit's upon me because I'm anointed. Right? You say, well, isn't that the same thing? Nope. The because means the why. If I said I'm anointed because the Spirit's upon me, then the Spirit being upon me is what makes me anointed. But it says the Spirit's upon me because I'm anointed. So the anointing came first and then the Spirit comes upon. So the Spirit coming upon is not the anointing. You see it? All right, let me, let me quote a verse we just read to you. Remember Galatians chapter 4? And because you are sons, he has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. What was first? Being a son or the spirit coming upon? 
being a son, and because you're a son, he sent his spirit. All right? Now look at this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So if the spirit's upon you because he's anointed you, then that means you were anointed before the spirit came upon you. Now you tie that with Galatians. that says because you're sons, he sent his spirit. That would make it look as though the anointing is being a son. Isn't that right? No. Don't both of them say the same thing? Because you're a son, he sent his spirit. Because he, now notice, the spirit's on me because I'm anointed. Now watch. If in, <clears throat> let me prove it to you. Matter of fact, go with me very quickly and then I'll send you on break. Go to 1 Samuel. You say, oh, we're going in the Old Testament? Yep, believe it or not, we're actually going over the Old Testament. You notice I preached all this week without going to the Old Testament? Yeah. First time we've gone to the Old Testament. Amen? 1 Samuel chapter 10. Can you believe somebody can actually preach that long without going to the Old Testament? Isn't that something? Don't have to go to the Old Testament. Preach the gospel. Hmm. Okay. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 10. Watch this. Then Samuel, verse 1. Then Samuel took it. Now this is the anointing of Saul to be king of Israel. Samuel goes to anoint Saul. Then Samuel took a vial of oil, poured it upon his head, and kissed him. And said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you to be captain over his inheritance? Right? Now let's just stop right there. Notice he said, okay, you got a picture of this. He goes to Saul. Samuel's there. He takes a vial of oil. Pours it on his head. Kisses him on the cheek. That's a traditional Middle Eastern greeting and custom. Kisses him on the cheek. And then says, Isn't the reason I'm doing this because... God has anointed you to be captain, king, over Israel, over his inheritance. Do you see what's going on? Now, this would be a physical anointing. Isn't that right? The oil, that would be the physical anointing. But he said, isn't this, in other words, isn't the reason I'm doing the physical anointing because God has already anointed you? Right? Right? So, now notice this. We, are, we have a physical anointing taking place to represent and to show a spiritual anointing that has already taken place. Right? Now, watch this. And, and I'll just go ahead and give you a hint. If you do a study on the anointing, especially through the Old Testament, you will find that every time, that there's two ways the, anointing, the word anointing is used. It talks about anointing objects to do with worship in the temple. And it talks about anointing people. Now, the anointing itself is always used to show whether it's used for objects or people. It is always used to show a separation and an appointment of a person or a thing from one position to another. Okay? In other words, you take the the utensils of the temple, they anointed them. That was called sanctifying them. That's what he said. Anoint it and sanctify it, which means to separate it for a holy use. Okay? And he said, when you, you anoint these utensils, then they, once you anoint them, they are only to be used in the temple for holy service. Okay? Then, every other time, it's talk, when it's talking about a person, it says, anoint the sons of Aaron, anoint these people. And when you do that, it says, sanctify them to me. So the anointing was used to appoint them into a position and to sanctify them or separate them from an old position into a new position. Every time the word anointing is used, it has to do with a placing into a new position. You, not giving a spiritual gift, not putting spiritual power on them or anything else. It was every time used to show a separation and an appointment to a position. Every time. So now watch. He said, look, isn't the reason I did this? Because God has already anointed you, appointed you to be king over Israel. He says, when you are, now he starts to prophesy. He says, when you are departed from me today, then you will find two men 
by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say unto you, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, your father is left to care the asses and sorrows for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Forward from there, and you will come to the plain of Tabor. And there shall meet you three men going up to God to Bethel. One carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute you and will give you two loaves of bread, which you will receive of their hands. Now, this is a prophecy. Right? This is pretty specific. And if, now, if you're going to come to me and give me a prophecy, make it like this. Right? Not, yay, yay, my little child, the Lord says I love you and wants to run through green pastures. Okay? Don't, don't, don't do that. Right? I know he loves me. I have no problem been singing that song since I was old enough to walk. Right? If you're going to come with a prophecy, make it like this. Give me specifics. Give me details. Mark it out. Amen? Otherwise, go prophesy to yourself. Okay? All right. <clears throat> You'd be surprised the prophecies I get. Everybody wants to lay hands on me. Usually so that whatever else we do from now on, they can claim part of it. Right? That's why I don't stand in line for people to lay hands on me. Right? I just don't do it. I'm very careful about who I get. A lot of people, I just don't want what they got. And if I don't know them, I sure don't want what they got. Right? I just... I got that from Dr. Summerall, so I'm just kind of stubborn like that. Okay? Just to share this with you, we were in Denver. Matter of no, I don't think Anyway, we were in Denver a while back. There was a minister there named David Wagner. He's a prophetic minister. And he was preaching that night. Preached a good sermon. It was, it was good stuff. But I still don't know him. And when he found out we were there, John Julek Ministries. Well, a lot of people act weird when they find that out. So he said, all right, because we were having a conference there, a meeting with all my leadership. So he... He said, I want all the, the John Julek ministries to come, come up here and line up uh, and just right here because he was going to give us a word. I don't know him. I've been there. I've been down that track. And they, a lot of times that's a way for somebody to, I don't know, just be something, you know. So I'm like, I'm sitting there. He says, yeah, if we can just get everybody to come up here and line up right here. And I look over at the pastor. I know the pastor and I look at them and him and his wife. And I'm like, and so they, he's looking like, what are you going to do? And I'm sitting there, and my whole team, my leadership team, there's about 10 or 12 of us all sitting there. They're all looking at me like, Curry, what are you? and I'm like, not going up there. And so this, I mean, it's quiet. Now, that's, that's uh, not comfortable, okay? <laughs> really, for me or him, okay? And he's like, yeah, if we can just, uh, John Jake Mins, if we just get y'all to line up right up here. He calls like three or four times, right? And I'm just sitting there, and he's... Um, and, he, and he's, uh, okay, well, um, and I was sitting right on the edge, and he said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to do this another way then, I guess. Because nobody's moving. Everybody's waiting for me to move, and I ain't moving, so nobody's moving. And I'm sitting there because I'm just, I've been trained by Dr. Sumrall. And Dr. Sumrall said, if it's a word from God, the man of God will have to deliver it. All right? Now, and if it's from God, I, I'm not going to just go up there and let him put his hands on me and say whatever he wants to say. I had another lady do that one time. She said, can I speak into your life? And I said, no. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you what. You speak, and I'll decide if it goes into my life. Right? right? I'm, not, I'm not going to go, oh, yeah, just say whatever you want to say. I'm not going to do it. I don't know people. You know? This stuff is more real than you think. It's not just neat little Christian stuff. All right? Remember when Esau, uh, Isaac blessed Esau, uh, Jacob instead of Esau? And then Esau comes in and goes, where's my blessing? And Isaac said, sorry, I already gave it away. That's how real that is. You couldn't just, oh, oh, he deceived me. Well, then it won't work. It still worked. Isn't it right? He couldn't take it back. So I don't, I don't mess with that stuff. This stuff is either real or it's not. If it's real, I want to make sure it's right. And so he comes over there by me and he starts to prophesy. And say, I don't like people laying hands on me unless I submit to that. And he never touched me. And, I, and so he started prophesying. And he was exactly right. I mean, right down the line, things going on. It was amazing. He, he even put out, my schedule wasn't online, and he even dic he uh, brought out the states I was going to next, in order. I mean, it was, it was an accurate, he was right, right? People say, well, don't you feel bad because you didn't go up there? No. God, God knows me. God knows him. And if it was real, he had to deliver it. And he proved to me it was real because he did deliver it, and he had to because he had to come forward. He could have just said, all right, we're going to move on. Could have done that. If he'd have done that, he'd have made me look bad. Right? That's all he had to do. Okay, well, they didn't go. Oh, well, that's Curry. He's just being, you know, thinks he's too good or something. No, it ain't that at all. I just don't know him. 
But instead, he came over and he delivered the word. It was exactly right. He went for it and he didn't touch me, which again proved me that it was God. And so when he got done, we, we got over there and they, they called me up to pray for people. Now I'll go up and pray for people. And so I went up and started praying for people. Before I did, I took my phone and said, I want you all to know what was taking place over here and why I did that and why that. And I explained it all to them. And they're like, ah. But see, at some point, you, just, you don't play church. Right? This stuff is real life. And you just don't play with it. All right? So, anyway. <clears throat> so, now, yeah, and he was very accurate. Okay? Very specific. He says here, uh, they'll salute you. Okay, verse 5. After that, you will come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. Oh, by the way, the word Philistine, modern pronunciation is Palestinian. Right? There's still a thorn in Israel's side because Israel didn't chase them out when they should have. And it shall come to pass, when you are come thither to the city, that you shall meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabray and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Now watch this, verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. Stop right there. Hear what that says? Now, he's been anointed because he was anointed. Right? Then he goes up the hill, does all this stuff. This is apparently later in the day. Right? And he says, this is all going to happen. Right? And then he talks about it. And it says, and he said, and here's what's going to happen. So he said, I'm doing, here's one anointing because you've already been anointed before by God. So that's two anointings. And after two anointings, and later in the day, the Spirit comes upon him. Right? Which shows that the anointing is not the Spirit coming on you. The Spirit coming on you and the anointing are two different things. Is that clear? Right? I mean, come on. You either believe the Bible or you don't. It's pretty clear. So the anointing... Because if, if the Spirit... See, if the Spirit coming on you is what made you anointed, then the Spirit would have been on him... The minute God anointed him to be king. Right? But it wasn't. He said, God's already appointed you. See, if you will change the word anointed for appointed, it'll clear all that up for you. He say, God is, isn't the reason I'm anointing you with this oil? Because God has already appointed you to be king. And because you've been appointed king over God's people, then God who sent his, the spirit into you. Isn't that what happened? All right, now look over, well, don't look, but just know, in Galatians, remember, because you are sons, you are no longer a servant, but a son. And because you're sons, the Father has, spent the Spirit, has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Isn't that right? Because you're a son, the Spirit comes upon you. So what is that? You are anointed, you are appointed. As many as received Him, gave He power to become the sons of God. You are appointed a son of God. That is your anointing. That is the appointing. That's why when you get born again, you can do anything you need to do as a son. At the moment you get an appointed, anointed as a son, that's you being the policeman right then. Right? The Spirit coming upon you. See, you can get out here. See, true, real people, good people, recognize the badge. The, the gun is not for good people. The badge is for good people. Right? People recognize the badge, they obey the badge. The gun is for bad people. Right? Good people don't need a gun to stop them. Good people recognize the badge and obey authority. Now, the, the policeman only needs the gun when the bad people don't recognize the authority of the badge. Now, you have authority. Now, understand this, not you, Christ, but you're in Him. It's not your authority, it's His authority. I'll prove it in just a second, or today. That authority, that you are appointed, anointed as a son. You're put into a position. And even though you're a child, you may act like a servant and have to be told what to do. But when you grow up, then you don't have to be told what to do. You do what you know you should do. That's a, that's a mark of maturity, is when you do what you should do without having to be told. Isn't that right? Now because of that, and because you're anointed as a son, he gives you the badge. When you become a son, you get the badge. Later, because you're a son, he sends his spirit into you. Now the spirit is the gun. Okay? Let me finish reading this. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you shall prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Now see, it sounds like baptism in the spirit. 
Right? You're going to begin to prophesy and be changed and all this. And let it be when these signs are coming to you that you do as occasion serve you. Notice it doesn't say do whatever I tell you to do right when I tell you to do it. It says you do as occasion serve you. In other words, you do what you decide needs to be done. See, people don't believe that when Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Well, he doesn't mean whatever. No, he means whatever as long as you ask according to his will, which you will do if you have your mind renewed to his will. Isn't that right? So he's not afraid to tell you whatever because he's assuming that that means that you're going to have your mind renewed to the word of God. And you're going to ask for the right things. Well, right here it says, do as occasion serve you. Do whatever you want to do. Well, if you say that, they'll do everything wrong. And they'll just do this or do that. Well, yeah, you can mess up. But God has faith in you. God has more faith in you than you do. I have more faith in you than you do. Because I know you can do what God said you can do. Why? Because I've trained people all over the world that do it, and I know it works. So I know if they can do it, you can do it. Amen? That's why. See, if you think I'm harsh on you... It's only because I know what you're capable of. This. And the problem is, you want to argue with me over about it, whether you're capable or not. Not that you want to argue, but you know what I mean. So, <clears throat> now. Where are we going here? Yeah. Yeah, go with me to Acts chapter 1, very quickly, and then I'll... Well, <laughs> it's almost time to go home. Acts chapter 1. All right. Starting in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Remember when we read that earlier? That the promise of the Father should come upon the Gentiles? You know that the promise, remember that? Now watch, because remember I told you earlier, the promise is not promises, it's not blessings. It's blessing. It's promise. The promise of the Father is not the blessings. The promise of the Father is the blessing of the Spirit. See, we think it's get, get in, come in, and that's what, we, that's what we advertise to people. Come in Christ and your world, your life will change. Things will get good. God wants all this stuff for you. And in reality, what he's saying is come into Christ and you get the Spirit. That's the promise, right? That's the legal promise that we can tell people. You come into Christ. I can't tell you your life's going to be easy. I can't tell you you're going to get rich. I can't tell you all these great things are going to happen like that. But I'll tell you this. You'll receive the Spirit. And with the Spirit, you can do this and you can do that. And you see, see, the Spirit gives you the ability to do things, not necessarily the ability to receive things. Right? Okay. He says, But wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For John baptized, truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So he is tying the promise of the Father with the baptism of the Spirit. Right? And because you are sons, he has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out of the Father. Right? Because you're appointed, anointed a son, he will send his Spirit. Now watch. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the, again the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which your father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power. And that word power is a Greek word, dunamis, and it means ability. It, technically, it means miraculous ability, actually. But you shall receive ability. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You hear that? You shall receive ability. Okay, that's the gun. Right? Becoming a son is the badge. After you become a son, after you got your badge, after you're appointed, anointed, then the Spirit comes upon you, then you receive ability, then you get your gun. You get it? See how simple this stuff is? And he says, watch. You shall receive power, ability. Now, going back to Luke again. Go to Luke chapter 10. One thing for sure, you're going to be able to tell people whenever you leave here that if you go to a Curry Blake seminar, you better bring your Bible. Amen? In verse 1, let's go to 
Uh, let's go to, go to verse 16. Luke 10, 16. He that hears you, hears me. Why? Because we're one, right? He that despises you, despises me. He that despises me, despises him that sent me. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Stop right there. You hear what he said? They come back and talk about devils getting cast out. And whenever he hears that, he relates devils getting cast out with Satan falling from heaven. All right? You want to talk about bringing down principalities? Kingdom warfare. Kingdom warfare. When you heal the sick, you bring Satan down. Whenever you cast out devils, you bring Satan down. Why? Because you are chipping away at his kingdom. He's already defeated, right? He's defeated. And now watch. Watch this. Behold. Look. See. Make sure. Check it out. Behold, I give unto you power. That word power is the Greek word exousia. And it means authority. Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power. That's a different word. That word power is the Greek word dunamis. Right? Now that word dunamis means ability. So what he says is, Behold, I give you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy. Now let me read you another part. See, I always tell people there's about four or five words that Christians can't believe. Or, or don't. Okay? About at least four or five. One is all. Right? Can't believe all. That's... Most Christians. Most of them can't believe whatsoever. Right? Can't believe whosoever. Most of them can't believe nothing. Can't believe these words. Right? Because we don't believe it. Watch, I'll show you. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Except generational curses. Uh, except, you know... Well, add anything in there except everything. Nothing shall hurt you except everything. <laughs> right? Because that's what it, everybody thinks everything can hurt. Do you, do you understand what that verse says? It says, he said, look, I am giving you authority over the devil's ability. You notice he didn't say the devil had authority? He said the devil had ability. That's why he's a robber and a thief. A robber has a, ability, but he doesn't have authority. If he had authority, he wouldn't be a robber. Right? He said, I give you authority over the devil's ability and nothing shall hurt you. That means the devil's ability. That means your authority quenches, puts out the fires of the devil's ability. Right? He says that the shield of faith shall quench every fiery dart of the wicked. Well, I tell you, the devil's after me. Have you ever seen most testimony services? Not, you wonder who they're testifying for. Because half the time it ain't God. Oh, the devil's after me. He's been after me all week. It's been a rough week. I tell you, I'll just pray for me, the Lord. And you know, and, and the, it's, it's some of the places I've been, it's been hilarious. Oh, I tell you what, the, the devil, he's after me. Bless his holy name. I tell you what. I, I've heard that. All right. And they go into this. Oh, the devil's after me. He's been after me. If y'all just pray for me. And I went to this one church, one Liberty Church. It's so funny because this lady, they went kind of across. This little old lady gets up. I just want to testify, Lord, praise the Lord in Jesus' name. And I just want to thank you, Lord, that. And Lord, Lord, I just bless you. And, and, and the devil's after me. And y'all just pray for me. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Click. I mean, that, that was it. It was like, was that tongues? <laughs> I mean, just right on through. It, but it's like, and then I realized, she probably has said the exact same thing for the last 10 years. You know, and that's why she can rally it out. So, well, we got to realize, nothing can hurt you. You understand? Well, yeah, but I'm sick. That's because you didn't know nothing could hurt you. <laughs> now you know. So tell us, it would say, well, it's sickness. <laughs> Devil, read this verse. Well, I'm sorry. Now, if you're deaf and dumb, let me read it to you. Right? Let me just point it out to you here. And you, get, you know you've got to read Scripture to the Devil. Right? Just point it out. Say, Devil, right there, it's written. Let me read it to you. And just point it out to him. But no, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Well, now if you go pray for someone of the devil, can the devil jump on you? No. Right? Deep theological understanding. Water runs downhill. Isn't that right? If I have enough power to kick that devil out, he ain't wanting to jump on me. You understand? 
So don't worry about devils jumping out of somebody and onto you when you're casting them out, right? And they may go jump on somebody else around you, but they're not going to jump on you. Why? Because you're the one hurting them. See, when you say in Jesus' name, they leave. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. The Bible says that when they hear the name Jesus, they tremble. Right? You just got to believe the Bible. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. You ought to just scare the devil every morning when you wake up. Dr. Sumrall used to get off planes. He'd stand up, get off plane. When his foot touched the ground, he'd say, Devil, I'm here. He was in Indonesia. Where was it? Indonesia, Philippines. I can't remember one of them places like that. He was over there <clears throat> staying in a house. It's hot. No air conditioning. Windows are open always. He's in bed. It's in the middle of the night, midnight, close to that. He's in bed. A devil comes in his room. Now through the window. Now I don't know why it felt like using a window. I guess it could have walked through a wall, but it came through a window. Right? And the curtain <laughs> moved. He said he saw it when it moved. He's lying in the bed against the wall. The devil moves the bed to the middle of the room. Summerall jumps up says, Devil, get out of here. <sighs> Went out, curtain ruffled. Went back over to get in his bed, looked at it. Walked back over to the window. Devil, get back in here. <sighs> Come back in. Said, Devil, that bed was against the wall when you came here. <laughs> and you're going to put it back. <sighs> right back against the wall. Now get out. It went out. He went over, laid down, went to sleep. He didn't go over there and sit there and go, oh, wow. <laughs> that was <weird. laughs> Why? He expected it. Smith Wigglesworth was awakened one night. Heard noise down in his, in his uh, living room. Came downstairs. Half asleep. Looked over. A devil, the devil, who knows for sure, but something was sitting there. It was a devil. Was sitting in his chair. Devil Wigglesworth looked at it and said, Oh, it's just you. Went back upstairs and went to sleep. You See, you want to be like these guys, but you, you don't get that way by being weak, scared sheep. You understand? You know, it's funny because we always talk about being sheep. But Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. The devil is called a lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour. That means he can't devour everybody. He's looking for the ones he can devour. He didn't say he goes around seeking everybody. He just goes around devouring people. He's looking. Can I devour you? No! Okay, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> You just got you got to learn to be able to speak strong to him and make him know. Wigglesworth was on a train thing one time, waiting to catch a train. A lady was standing there next to him. She had a little dog, a little dog standing there, jumping around. The train starts to come up. She's like, No, now, honey, go home. Go, go on home. The dog, you know, just jumps around. The train's getting closer, and Wigglesworth's just standing there watching her. She goes, Now, honey, no, no, puppy, go. You gotta go on home, go on home. The dog's just jumping around, like not paying attention. The train starts to pull up. She turns around. She goes, Now I said, Get! Dog takes off. Wigglesworth goes, That's how you got to treat the devil. He used to tell people, I don't hit people. say, Why do you hit people? He said, I don't hit people. I hit the devil. People get in the way. <laughs> All right? That's the way. It. Now, I'm not telling you you got to be mean and rough. Summerall was pretty rough. All right? 